the Alps, from Slovenia to Switzerland, a journey across Europe's most prominent mountain range. Tauern in the Central Alps. Here the people live in close communion with the mountains. At Bavaria's Lake Königssee, farmers have a very special technique of herding their cattle up the mountain. Beneath the Earth's surface, a geologist is exploring caves formed by the last ice age. The journey leads through Salzburg County and the neighboring national parks, from Salzburg over the Dachstein Mountains and the Großglockner, Austria's highest summit. From there northwards to Schönau on Lake Königssee. These mountain ridges were formed millions of years ago by the sediments of a primordial ocean. Since then, they were shaped by several ice ages, the wind and the weather. The Alpine valleys were first settled around 6,000 years ago. From the early Middle Ages, larger villages and towns emerged. Salzburg is one of the oldest. Only a few kilometers lie between the festival town and high mountain ranges. Salt trade made the city rich. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, its most celebrated son, made it famous. Salzburg's landmark is Fortress Hohen Salzburg, one of Europe's largest medieval castle complexes. It looms over the city and its almost 150,000 inhabitants. Salzburg is a Baroque ensemble of residences, churches and gardens. During festival season, the entire city makes for a perfect stage set. In summer, Salzburg Festival draws thousands of culture enthusiasts to the Cathedral Square. The old town lies on the banks of the Salzach River and is surrounded by four mountains Festungsberg, Mönchsberg, Kapuzinerberg and Rheinberg. The festival hall was carved into the rock face. What appears idyllic can also be treacherous. The mountains consist of brittle rocks. Salzburg's mountain cleaners make sure that the rubble doesn't fall onto roofs and that it doesn't block the roads. It's a tough job in summer when it can get up to 35 degrees and you're hanging on a vertical rock face. Some of the rocks weigh between 150 and 200 kilos and you have to make sure that you get them down safely. After knocking off for the day, all your muscles ache. Martin Schierhuber heads a team of 10 mountain cleaners. He's on duty all year round, in all weather conditions. Two hundred meters above the city, when you're hanging off the rock face, you've got a fantastic view over the town. In these moments I always say to myself, it's your job to make sure nothing happens to the people living there. You're responsible for their safety. The men not only break away loose stones, but also monitor cracks and crevices in the rock. The profession of the mountain cleaners was introduced over 300 years ago. Yeah. 
1669, there was a big rockfall in the Gestettengassen, killing 220 people. From then on, the city council established a committee to take care of the mountains. They're all qualified craftsmen, joiners, bricklayers and stonemasons. Comradeship is the most important thing of all. If you're working on the wall in teams of two and the colleague needs your help, then you have to be able to trust each other completely. Of course, it's also about the thrill. That's something we get every day. Things do happen occasionally, they're bound to. And then you can't help but think, I hope I make it back home safe and sound to my family tonight. The roots of the plants growing on the bluffs are so powerful that they can extend crevices and cracks and even cause entire slabs of rock to break off. In spite of the danger, Martin Schierhuber wouldn't want to swap his job with anyone. In summer, when it's really beautiful outside and I'm looking down at the city or St. Peter's Cemetery, I often think that I work in one of the most spectacular places in the world. And that really is the beauty of it. The next leg of the journey leads to the Dachstein Mountains. Along the route lies Anif. The water palace of Anif was built in around 1520 and served as the summer residence of bishops. In 1918, Anif briefly rose to fame. King Ludwig III of Bavaria took refuge here during the November Revolution. Nearby, a bird that was almost extinct in Europe is being brought up, the northern bald ibis. Here the breed is trained before being released into the wild for the first time. biologists have become foster mothers to the ibis birds. They want them to become accustomed to humans. One of the foster mothers is Daniela Trober. I always wanted to work with animals, especially birds. As a foster mum, I'm in such close contact with the animals and that is really important to me. With their arms, the biologists imitate the beak greeting of the ibis. Only three days after the ibis hatch, the foster mothers take over their upbringing and care. Daniela must establish a close relationship to the animals. For me, the ibis is a very special bird. Firstly, because he looks rather peculiar. He really doesn't look like a normal bird. And secondly, because of his behavior. The more I stroke him, the stronger our relationship gets and the more often he comes over and is pleased to see me. The Salzburg Mountains used to be the birds' last breeding grounds in all of Europe. But at around 1600, they disappeared even from there. 
man had eradicated them by hunting. If he's a little rough sometimes, it doesn't mean that he wants to hurt me. Sometimes he can't coordinate his movements or he gets a bit overexcited. But actually, he only comes over to have a little cuddly and be stroked. Daniela knows that she's working with wild animals. But as long as they're in her care, she can adopt the role of their mother. In summer, the birds face their hardest challenge. They're migratory birds, but in captivity, they haven't learned where to go for the winter or how to get there. In many hours of training, the birds are conditioned to the signals and calls of their foster mothers. First, they're familiarized with the aircraft on the ground, as to them the sound of the propeller is rather distressing. Flight training is always a delicate business. The birds must understand that it's me, their foster mother, sitting in the aircraft. It takes a little while for them to get it, and then we can start the migration. Training the birds for migration takes seven weeks. Always before the first feed of the day, Daniela takes them for a flight. When they're hungry, they're particularly motivated to follow her. It's a 1,300-kilometer journey to the wintering grounds in Tuscany. Depending on the weather, it takes up to five weeks. In several stages, the journey leads from Anif along the edge of the Alps to Italy. Though the ibis is a protected species there, it's frequently prey to hunters. Cause for Daniela to worry about her birds. In three years' time, she'll discover how many of her foster children manage to return to Salzburg. That is when the first ones will come back to Anif to breed. On the one hand, it's always sad for me as a foster mother to let them go. But on the other hand, it's wonderful being able to help bring the ibis back to the Alps. The flight continues to the Dachstein Mountains. On the way southeast, the double summit of the Bishop's Cap. It once used to be the border between the Archduchy of Austria and the Archbishopric of Salzburg. The Dachstein Mountains stretch across three Austrian states. In 1810, the passionate mountaineer Archduke Johann of Austria was the first to cross it. Today, the mountain hut serves as a starting point for tours. The mountains have been well developed for climbers, and aren't considered particularly challenging. However, there are still accidents occasionally. In the surrounding valleys, loden cloth is produced. Drying pieces of material can be seen all over the area. We 
I would say that Loden is very traditional for the Alps, as it has always been the tradition to keep sheep. At some point, the people decided to do something with the wool they had. That's how Loden was developed. Our company, the Loden Spinning Mill, is the oldest trade firm in Styria. It's been around since 1434, of which we're of course very proud. A few years ago, Jörg Steiner took over the business from his father. I particularly like the fact that we still work with traditional methods and machines. I mean, some of these machines are about 200 years old. We rough it with thistles, dry it outside and only use natural materials. And even so, we don't make old-fashioned but modern and innovative clothes. The basis of every piece of Loden is wool. Globalization hasn't ignored the Steiner family's business. Australian and New Zealand wool is more popular, as it's much finer and the clothes you can make with it don't scratch. Some people might remember how grandma's socks might be warm, but were terribly scratchy. And that is hardly ever the case with Australian and New Zealand wool. Previously, alpine wool was mainly used by shepherds. Today, Loden is getting more and more popular with skiers. Despite all those modern high-tech fibers around these days, Loden is the only thing that still warms when it's damp or wet. Up to 16 steps are necessary to create the fine Loden material in the mill. Weaving and fulling, dyeing, ironing and pressing is all done by machines. Jörg Steiner's keen eye and the final touches, however, cannot be replaced by any machine. To pass on the tricks of the Loden trade to the next generation is his greatest wish. When the time comes, I would love my son to carry on the business and take it over from me. That would be wonderful. But of course, we've still a few years to go before that happens. Lorden products from Ramsau find customers all over the world. The route leads us further to the west, to Sankt Veit in the district of Pongau. We follow the main ridge of the Alps, the great watershed, but it remains shrouded by the clouds. Some 80 kilometers south of Salzburg, the cultured landscape unfolds, with villages at the bottom of the valley, mountain farms on the sun terraces, and alpine chalets right up to the tree line. Up here, the Radl family live tucked away they've particularly lost their hearts to one of the mountain inhabitants, the marmot. What started out 30 years ago with the care of a few orphaned animals soon developed into a passion.
up to eight rodents live in the outdoor enclosure and dig three meter long tunnels in the garden. Walter and Katharina Radl breed marmots and pass them on to zoological gardens. With a heavy heart, they release the remaining young animals into the wild in autumn, much to the pleasure of walkers. During the summer months, marmots eat large amounts of food to store energy in fat deposits. This enables them to survive hibernation from October to April. Katharina and Walter Radl feed the animals three times a day. They're such sweet, gentle animals, and they just seem to be satisfied with life, don't they? If you come across them up in the mountains and hear them squealing, it really tears at the heartstrings. It's a great experience. Now let's see if you've put on weight. Right. 2.30. Well done. The animals weigh up to 5 kilos. A marmot has to gain 50 times the weight it had at birth to survive the winter. Their preferred diet consists of thistles, mountain clover and dandelions. The Radl family add carrots, oat flakes and rusks to the menu. The marmots sleep in the winter and we don't have any work with them. And in the summer, when they are out and about, it's so nice to see them. We give them oats and carrots and Daddy has to mow the lawn. For the past 25 years, Walter Radl and his wife have spent the summer months in their mountain cabin and done all the chores that go with it. When we go up here and first enter the house in summer, I always feel my heart lift. There's so much happiness and love that went into this place. Walter Radl opens his enclosures to visitors. That's earned him the nickname Marmot Grandad in the region. We do feel like their parents. And I think they feel like we're part of the family too. They're such docile animals and very socially minded. From the Radl family, we're headed to Austria's highest mountain. The Großglockner area is part of the High Tower National Park. Mighty U-shaped valleys like Fuscher Valley, formed by glaciers in the Ice Age, lead up to the Glockner Massif. Fast-flowing streams and waterfalls rush down the steep slopes. The landscape here in High Tauern National Park is diverse. This is the largest protected area in the entire Alpine region. Since 
since the 1930s, a succession of hairpin bends wind their way up the mountain giant. The Großglockner High Alpine Road. Most transit is swallowed up by several tunnels. Today, the mountain pass is, above all, a panoramic road for drivers who want to take the scenic route. Almost 50 kilometers of high alpine road twist and turn up to the summit. At almost 3,800 meters, the Gorsglockner crests the high Tauern. Tauern is an old German term for mountain passes. Roman soldiers once crossed them, later Venetian tradesmen and Salzburg bishops. The pass road follows the so-called mule track, along which pack horses and mules once transported cloth, wine, spices and salt over the Alps. For the horses and carts, the mountain pass was too steep. Tony Sauper continues in this tradition. Den selben Berg zu Fuß to climb the same mountain on foot is a very different experience from riding up on horseback, because the horse is a further mediator between man and nature. Together with the horse, you have to find your way along and see how far you can go. It makes it possible to venture into very different terrain where you normally wouldn't come across horses. For many years, Tony Sauper worked in a hotel. Five years ago, he turned his passion, trail riding, into a profession. Tony Sauper trains his most important staff himself as he must be able to rely on the sure-footedness and endurance of his horses. He first familiarizes the young animals with the work as pack horses. Of course you start off with easier tours. The largest part of the training is taken over by the more experienced animals. I've discovered that the horses learn more from each other than you would expect. Some learn in no time at all. Others take longer before they're confident enough for the more difficult routes. After all, we climb up to over 3,000 meters. The paths were once used by local farmers who carry deliveries across the Alps with their heavily laden horses and mules. Their horses were used to the terrain, halflingers, a breed originating in the Alps. They were the delivery boys of the Middle Ages. Just as a group of merchants would travel together as a caravan through the desert, here the goods were transported over the mountains. And for the farmers of the area who were largely self-sufficient, it was one of the few ways of making an extra living. What was once a hard-earned income, the trained mountain and ski guide Tony Zalpa now offers as a romantic experience. From his farm, he treks through the mountains to discover and transmit a different mode of travel. To prepare his tours, he must always re-explore the route. There are places where the melting of the snow or a landslide have rendered it impassable. One of the main things it helps you to achieve is to slow the pace. You become one with the body of the horse. If you ride a horse for a long time and get to know its character, then the horse reacts to small things. 
Sometimes I feel as if they instinctively do what I'd like them to, without me using the reins to tell them. He takes his horses through the mountains for up to seven days at a time. He has known the landscape since birth, but he still discovers new things. To me, the mountains are so complex because I get to experience them in so many different ways. I consider it to be a gift. The next destination of the journey is Liogang. Along the snowy edges of the high Taiwan mountains, the route leads through snow and ice. It's winter here for eight months of the year. When the glaciers retreated, mountain lakes remain that feed countless streams. The Alps are the largest water reservoir in Europe. While on the plains most of the rainwater evaporates, here it flows into a labyrinth of streams and rivers. Water is becoming an increasingly sought-after resource that people in the Alps are harnessing. One example is the Dam of Caprun. It's 2,000 meters above sea level. The water that's used in the power station to generate electricity consists mainly of melted snow from the Großglockner glacier. Lake Zell was created during the last ice age, around 16,000 years ago, by erosion through glacial ice on the Glockner. The Liogang stone mountains rise up to 2,600 meters but they still shrink in the shadow of their neighbors, the Kitzbühel and the Berchtesgaden Alps. For climbers, the mountains with their cast rock faces have a lot to offer. A Viennese theatre group has converted a quarry into an open-air stage. The independent theatre group rehearses at an altitude of 2,000 metres and in all weather. It's the sixth season they've performed in the Leogang Mountains. One of the actors is Amalia Altenberg. Performing here is almost easier than on a normal stage. I can be much more natural here. We 
We go out there and deal with whatever we come across, whether it be the weather or animals. It's our principle not to change anything, just to accept nature as it is, because it's stronger than us anyway, and certainly stronger than any idea a person could have. The forest and its myths are the theme of this year's season. In preparation, Amalia and her colleagues spoke to foresters, hunters and biologists from Leogang. During the months of rehearsal, this prompted new improvisations that in the end come together as a play. Amalia plays Frau Perchter, an old woman from a Leogang folktale. The locals have told her all the stories they know. When you talk to the old people in the village, they tell you that they actually met these characters, or that they had encounters with the mountain spirits. A theatre at an altitude of 2,000 meters. No stage, no curtain, no stalls and that even draws audiences from Salzburg or Munich. When I stand there and act, in this incredible setting, I'm really moved. The mountains just have an amazing force, and this creates a natural echo. And this erzeugt natürlich an echo. Here we head north to Lake Königssee. Along the way, the Steinerne Meer, the Sea of Stones. This uninhabited rocky plateau forms a natural barrier between Salzburg County in Austria and Lake Königssee in Germany. Hardly any mountains rise up out of the 2,000 meter high karst plateau, but there are around 800 caves beneath the surface. The area's ruggedness makes it so fascinating. landscape, the Riemann house almost appears like a space station. Only a third of about 63 summits have been developed with marked paths or rope routes for walkers. Not far off lies Lake Funtensee. At an altitude of over 1,600 meters, it's Germany's cold pole. The lowest temperature ever measured here was minus 45.9 degrees Celsius. Lake Königssee is one of Germany's most visited sites, although it's not suitable for swimming. Even in summer, the water only reaches a maximum temperature of 16 degrees. At 
At the foot of the massif lies the chapel of St. Bartholomew. King Ludwig II once saved it from decay. The church is named after St. Bartholomew the Apostle, the patron saint of Alpine farmers. Pasture farming is only possible in the summer and only on a small strip of land on the southern bank of the lake. For the farmers, even the sparsest green is highly valuable. Many of these pastures have been grazed since the Middle Ages. Alpine farmer Stefan Resch and his helpers set off with his herd of cows over the lake. It's always a bit of tension, as it's different every time. When the animals leave, it makes you think, what will the summer be like? When we get them out of the stables, I always feel a little sad. When you're saying your morning prayers and know you're sending the cows off afterwards, it's all quite overwhelming. Every year, Stefan Resch takes his animals up to Salat Alp. Farming is not his main income, but his passion. The cows must stand as close together as possible. That makes them calm during the crossing. Once the boat starts to sway, there's a risk of capsizing. If there was a storm, then things would get a little critical, but we're going along the left side, the shallow end. If anything happens, we could immediately sail towards the bank and try to get the situation under control. In these water temperatures, the cows wouldn't stand much of a chance if they had to swim for a long time. To keep the cows calm, the farmers play the accordion. In former times, farmers had to walk all the way around the lake to get to the alpine pastures. That meant seven hours across the dangerous terrain on the steep bank. The animals enjoy it. You see it when they walk off the boat. They know their way, go straight to the pasture where they always are, graze for a while and then lie in the sun. The cows will spend the summer on the pastures along Lake Königssee. Farmer Stefan Resch visits his animals several times a week so that they recognize him when he comes to collect them in autumn. All of our animals have a name. When I go out to the pastures, I call, hey, Edelweiss, or Rugai, or whatever their names are, Sengai. There are lots of nice names, and many of them refer to the landscape. And they always lift their heads and know, he means me. And then they come over to me. That's because I make sure they remember me.
The last leg of the journey is a short flight over Berchtesgaden National Park to Untersberg. It's considered to be a magic mountain shrouded in myth. Emperor Karl the Great is said to have lived here and there's a legend that the mountain has swallowed people. For their disappearance, there's a simple geological explanation. The Untersberg is full of dolines or sinkholes that permeate the karst mountain massif. More than 400 caves fascinate geologists and explorers. Geologist Georg Zagler and his colleagues have already explored over 36 kilometers of cave. It takes you to places no human has treaded before. You never know what is going to be around the next corner. It's incredibly fascinating entering into new territory, measuring it, charting it, discovering crystals. It's all about the curiosity. Every year the scientists uncover two kilometers of impassable territory. A two-week expedition begins. The temperature in the mountain is zero degrees. You might enter an ice cave comfortably one year and find that you're standing by a lake the next. And then you have to try to cross it somehow. No one can contact us here. No radio waves are getting through. Nothing. We're completely cut off from the outside world. A nuclear bomb might have been thrown and we wouldn't even notice. Bivouacking up to 900 meters below the ground, the speleologists use carbide lamps with a flame that lasts for days. This may become a matter of life and death if the scientists lose their way. If one of us has an accident, one or two days walk from the outside world, you need someone to look after him and get help. And particularly if the accident occurs in a damp area, you have to act quickly. Someone who just lies around and isn't kept warm with a sleeping bag, if it isn't available, will freeze from the inside. That's when working together is really important. Your life always depends on your colleagues. When Georg Zagler is inside the mountain, he climbs the subterranean labyrinth for hours without a break. Sometimes you go down two or three hundred meters to then climb up the same distance again later and in the end you've only covered a distance of about 50 meters. You can't always take the direct way. The scientists collaborate with the federal state government. They examine deposits and new mineral formations in the underground cavities. The stones that we examine on the Untersberg itself are over 200 million years old, incredibly old. The caves are comparatively young and were created towards the end of when the Alps were formed. So they're about 14 million years old.
da drinnen im Berg ist dann oft die Zeit. Inside the mountain, time is relative. There are often days when we go climbing for 20 hours. If I thought of doing that on the outside, then everyone would say, are you insane? But inside the mountain, that's completely normal. Time has no meaning. Im Berg verliert die Zeit die Bedeutung. When he returns, Georg Zagler won't be outside for long. He still has more secrets to explore inside the mountain, as do the many mountaineers upon whom the Untersberg has cast its spell. <laughs> 